Scott Cawthon fell into a deep depression. He had just finished making a game he thought would be the one. He had spent decades trying to make a successful game. Then one day, it finally happened. So how did one man who failed repeatedly end up creating one of the most popular indie games of all time? And how did he go from making $50 a month from his games to amassing a net worth of $70 million? The story of Five Nights at Freddy's is a story of inspiration, a story of hard work and how failure can lead to success. Today, Five Nights at Freddy's is a successful franchise with 13 games, 28 books, and one film, with another on the way. It created a new genre of video games and changed the industry as we know it. This is the story of how one man's perseverance led to success. This is the story of how Five Nights at Freddy's changed the world. Scott Cawthon was born in Houston, Texas in 1978. Throughout his childhood, Scott always wanted to be a game developer. So when his mother bought him a copy of a new game creation software called Click and Play by Click Team, which made it easy for beginners to create games due to its user-friendly interface, he immediately jumped into it and taught himself how to develop. At the age of 13, he created a game in which a blue blob moved around the deck of a pirate ship collecting red gems while avoiding the pirates. This game was very experimental in nature and was made to test what was possible with the software. He quickly realized that he wanted to make a better one. So soon after Scott made his first unofficial game, Doofus. This was a beat-em-up game where you played as Doofus the dinosaur and had to shoot and destroy the many enemies in order to get from one level to the next. After making Doofus, Scott fell in love with the click and play software and realized that making games didn't have to be so hard. He wanted to get better at game design, so after graduating from high school, he attended the Art Institute of Houston. At school, he learned to create computer graphics using his favorite software, 3DS Max, which he used to model, render, and animate. And at home, he continued to use Click and Play, which later became Click Team Fusion and improved his game development skills with the software. He started implementing the computer graphics that he learned at school into his games. This continued until he graduated. Around this time, as a Christian, Scott felt he needed to incorporate his Christian faith into his projects, which led him to join Hope Animations, where he began creating various independent animations using his degree in computer animation. Hope Animations describes itself as a collaborative project of Christian animators, programmers, and designers who want to spread the message and teachings of Jesus Christ and the Bible through the use of new media, digital art, computer games, and animation. He has created several films for them, including Noah's Ark, The Pilgrim's Progress, A Christmas Journey, and The Jesus Kids Club. When Scott joined them, he knew he wouldn't make much money, if any, but he felt it was something he had to do. To supplement his income, he began working various retail jobs such as working in the backroom freezer at Target and as a cashier at Dollar General. He also continued to work on his games, creating several in a short period of time, the most notable of which was Legacy of Flan. Scott called it his first official game and was very proud of it. Some other notable projects around this time were RPG Max, Stellar Gun, several Legacy of Flan, spin-offs and sequels, Bogart 1 and 2, The Desolate Room, and finally Ifermoon, which is Scott's first professional game in which he published on his website making around $1,000 for charity. But he didn't stop there, he continued to create, hoping that his games would be his main source of income. He created two religious games, Pilgrim's Progress based on the John Bunyan allegory and Scott's earlier animation of the same name. The other game was The Desolate Hope. Both games were very well received and brought some attention to his work, but unfortunately it wasn't enough. Both were financial failures. Soon after, Scott was browsing the Click Team forums, a place for the Click Team community to connect, collaborate, and access resources. He came across a post about a developer in the community called D-Town Tony. D-Town Tony had created a very successful mobile game called Pocket Ninjas, which had 600,000 downloads in less than a week. At the time, it was the most successful iOS game that had been developed using the Click Team Fusion software. This was a huge inspiration for Scott. D-Town Tony proved that it was possible to make a successful game using the same software he had used since childhood. As a result, Scott decided to switch to making free-to-play mobile slot games, which he thought would provide a steady source of income to support his family. It didn't. He was making about $40 to $50 a month from them. Scott was confused about what to do, so he decided to go back to college to learn Unity, but he quickly realized that it would 
would take him years to get up to his current level in Click Team Fusion 2.5, so he decided to stick with what he knew and dropped out. Sometime in 2013, Scott found out about Steam Greenlight, which was a system on Steam where developers could put their games on Steam Greenlight and users could vote on indie games to determine which titles would be released on the Steam marketplace. So he decided to submit his best game, originally developed for mobile devices Chipper & Sons Lumber Company, a family-friendly construction and management game where you play as Tyke, a young beaver starting out in the lumber business. The gameplay includes chopping down trees, collecting and selling wood, and buying or finding various items to make the business easier. The game received mixed reviews, with some players praising the gameplay. However, an overwhelming number of players and reviewers felt that the art style was too scary for children and that the characters in the game were creepy and resembled scary animatronics. The negative reviews of the game finally caught up with Scott. The next day, he decided to remove the game from Steam Greenlight. For the first time in his life, when he was already at a breaking point, Scott had to deal with negative criticism. It caused him to become very depressed, so much so that his life insurance policy was cancelled. He would sit in his room and wonder if God even existed. Either God didn't exist or God hated me. He realized that he had spent his life pursuing game development, and it was time to let go of that dream. He thought it was over, but Scott was wrong. In fact, his life had just begun. Scott went back to his computer and sat there thinking about the reviews, how prominent reviewers had torn it apart, claiming that the main character resembled a terrifying animatronic animal. But then he thought to himself, I bet I can make something much scarier than that. He immediately opened 3DS Max and got to work modeling the characters, and then he imported all his work into Click Team Fusion 2.5 and started coding the game. He visited several websites to buy the sound effects, and when he couldn't find what he needed, he created them himself. Scott knew that he wanted the game to have an underlying story, similar to his previous work. After talking to his family to get some ideas, he began writing and developing the game. He spent the next month similar to how he always did. Create game, go to work, sleep and repeat. Create game, go to work, sleep and repeat. Create game, go to work, sleep and repeat. When it was almost finished, he had his two sons and some friends beta test it. They loved it. And Scott knew he had a great game on his hands. And finally, six months later, the game was finished. Five Nights at Freddy's was released on IndieDB, Desura, and submitted to Steam Greenlight in the summer of 2014. Soon after, it was accepted on Steam in August of the same year. Five Nights at Freddy's, also known as FNAF, is a survival horror game set in a fictional pizza restaurant called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, where the player takes the role of a night shift security guard named Mike Schmidt. After receiving a phone call from Phone Guy, voiced by Scott Cawthon himself, you learn the main objective, which is to survive the night by monitoring the security cameras and ensuring that the animatronic characters, Freddy, Bonnie, Foxy, and Chica, that roam the restaurant at night, do not reach the security office and harm you. Compared to other indie games at the time, the game's gameplay mechanics were unique and it was praised for its creative art style. The game quickly gained popularity, with many prominent Let's Players posting gameplay videos on YouTube. Scott was amazed to see the number of downloads grow rapidly from 5,000 to 10,000 to 20,000 to 30,000. He couldn't believe that everything he had worked for over the last 20 years was finally happening. His game was a success. Realizing that he had to capitalize on the momentum, he immediately set to work on the sequel, doubling down on everything that was working. Three months later, Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was released. The game underwent significant gameplay changes, including the removal of doors and a revised progression system that required you to face the same level of threats at 2 a.m as at 5 a.m. In addition, a mask is used to ward off animatronics and a music box must be wound to keep a certain animatronic, the puppet, at bay. The game has similar graphics to FNAF 1 and introduces new toy animatronic versions of the original crew. Reviews of the game were mixed, with some critics praising its innovative gameplay and improved story over its first iteration. However, many casual gamers found the game more stressful than scary due to its steep difficulty curve. Overall, the game was a great success for Scott, who was able to maintain the momentum of FNAF. He immediately began work on the next game. Four months later, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was released. The game was very different from its predecessors. It was set years in the future from FNAF 2 and featured only one main antagonist, Springtrap, aka William Afton. You also had to deal with phantom animatronics. Although they cannot directly harm you, they can cause interference that makes it easier for Springtrap to reach you. In terms of difficulty, many players found it easier than FNAF 2 as the game becomes much easier once you have mastered the management system. Most fans enjoyed the game, especially those who appreciated the lore and changes from previous installments. 
Scott was once again successful and decided it was time to create his scariest game yet, and four months after FNAF 3, it was released. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was released on July 23, 2015, three months ahead of its scheduled release date of October 31, 2015. This game differs greatly from the previous three installments, with the most significant change being the main character. Instead of playing as a night shift security guard, you play as a child in their bedroom, using a flashlight to check the doors, closet, and bed to fend off the animatronic nightmares. This is the first game that allows you to move around instead of being stationary, completely eliminating the security cameras and relying on audio cues to track the animatronics movement, which helps intensify the scares due to players having to use headphones to play the game optimally. FNAF 4 is regarded as the most challenging game in the series because you must listen attentively as missing a single audio cue could result in a game over. However, this game was not well received by many players, who were angered by Scott's decision to change the game from a strategy-based management system to a sound-based jump-scare simulator. Some players felt that the game was unfinished and lacked a proper story ending, as it was originally intended to be the conclusion of the FNAF series. They believed that Scott was exploiting the FNAF series by creating multiple games and prolonging the series to maximize profits. So five days after the game's release, Scott published a now-deleted community post on Steam entitled Make a Difference in response to the backlash he had received. In the post, he addresses the hate he received and the speculation that he was milking his games. He begins the post with a thank you and says that he is a bit stressed after working non-stop for a year. He addresses the haters who only hate him because he is successful and then he talks about how he just worked at Dollar General last year. He then ends the post with an inspirational message to all aspiring game developers and YouTube creators. Two months later, Scott posted another community update about his latest project, a role-playing game called FNAF World. In the same post, he made a contradictory claim, stating, It is very important for me to say again that there will not be a Five Nights at Freddy's 5. The story is complete and the Halloween update and new game will not add to it. However, this turned out to be false. Around this time, Scott was also working on his debut book, Five Nights at Freddy's, The Silver Eyes, which was released on Kindle on December 17, 2015. The novel introduced new characters to the FNAF series and expanded the lore. However, the book received mixed reviews. Some readers found the pacing slow at times and felt that the main cast was bloated, with several unnecessary characters. Additionally, several readers complained that the book did not match up with the lore from the games. However, others enjoyed the book, with some outlets comparing it to Stephen King's It and praising it for its themes of horror and mystery. Scott has once again achieved success with his book, which spent four weeks at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. This success motivated him to continue creating more books. One month after this, FNAF World was released. Unfortunately, FNAF World was unfinished and plagued with bugs and glitches leading to its removal from Steam. It was obvious to many that Scott was overworked, having taken on too many projects in a short period of time. For example, while coding the game, he made numerous technical mistakes that made it difficult to update and fix. This led to Scott putting the game up for free on GameJolt to make up for it. The game's reception was again mixed, with many players confused by the sudden change to an RPG. But the hardcore fanbase that Scott had built up in less than two years loved it, appreciating the return to the unique art style of Scott's older games and his willingness to try new things with the series. However, Scott knew the critics were right. He had made the game far too quickly and realized it was time to give up trying to fix his mistakes and move on to something else. Within three months of this situation, Scott was teasing another FNAF game called Sister Location on his website. This left the community divided. Half were very excited about a new FNAF game, the other half were disappointed believing that FNAF had ended with FNAF 4. Despite all this, Scott was hard at work on his biggest project yet. On October 7, 2016, Five Nights at Freddy's Sister Location was released. The game was his most extensive project to date, featuring full voice acting, music composition, cutscenes, objectives, and the ability to move between rooms. The game deviated from the original gameplay but delved deeper into the lore. Some fans appreciated the expanded features, varied gameplay, and improved script. However, the fourth night minigame left a lasting stain on the game due to its challenging scenario in which the player is stuffed into a springtrap suit and must manage it while being crawled on by tiny animatronics called mini arenas. This particular minigame was extremely difficult and led to a huge amount of backlash from the community. As a result, Scott patched the game and reduced the difficulty. Unfortunately, some game reviewers had already dismissed the game, claiming it was not a true FNAF game. But for the first time in Scott's history, he didn't let the critics get to him and immediately started on his next project. 
A year later, the sixth game in the series, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, was released. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, also known as FNAF 6, is a unique addition to the Five Nights at Freddy's series. The game combines business simulation with the classic survival horror of FNAF. It starts with an 8-bit minigame in which you control Freddy Fazbear and deliver pizzas to children. This is what many players expected the game to be, based on the Steam Store page. In addition, the game was offered for free, leading many to believe that it was a small spin-off minigame rather than a full-fledged installment. However, after encountering glitches in the minigame, the player is taken to a dark room where they must observe and document the behavior of a broken animatronic named Scrap Baby in order to salvage it for money. The game requires you to complete tasks in a pizzeria, manage sponsorships and advertisements, and play mini-games throughout the day to earn extra money, which can be used to purchase animatronics, accessories, and attractions that will reward you with more money. At night, various tasks on the computer must be completed while monitoring vents, room temperature, and noise levels. It is also the first game in the series to feature multiple endings, with the true ending wrapping up the story once and for all. Pizzeria Simulator is a highly acclaimed game in the series. It has been praised for its hybrid gameplay and for tying up loose ends in the franchise. Many articles have called it a must-play game, and it has been featured as the best horror game of 2017. After Pizzeria Simulator, many fans thought the series was over, but Scott had one last hurrah. In February 2018, Scott announced on Steam that he would consider seeking assistance from larger publishers to create future games. He stated, I wanted to finish the series myself, and I didn't trust anyone else to do it. Whether or not that was a good decision can be debated, but I I wanted to finish the story, even if a bigger game publisher could have maybe done a better job. At this juncture though, with the release of Pizzeria Simulator, I feel good about revisiting some of those opportunities. So yeah, there will hopefully be more FNAF games at some point in the future, but they won't come directly from me anymore. In the same post, Scott also planned to add a DLC expansion pack for Pizzeria Simulator called Ultimate Custom Night, a mode where you can choose up to 50 animatronic characters from all the Five Nights at Freddy's games, and you can mix and match characters, all with different mechanics to master and set their difficulty from 0 to 20. The higher the difficulty level, the more points you earn. These points are then used to unlock 14 different intermission cutscenes. This game had everything a FNAF fan could want, such as the original gameplay mechanics, replayability, and endless customization. However, due to the size of the game, Scott had no choice but to make it a standalone game, and on June 27, 2018, Ultimate Custom Night was released. The game received tons of praise from the community, with an overwhelmingly positive review status on Steam and it was the perfect way to end the FNAF series for good, or so we thought. Before we get into the new FNAF games and the FNAF film, I wanted to spend the next few chapters talking about what the indie game market was like before FNAF came along and the factors that led to FNAF's success. So what exactly is an indie game? An indie game, short for independent video game, is a video game typically created by individuals or smaller development teams without the financial and technical support of a major game publisher, as opposed to most AAA games. To name just a few, you may know that Minecraft, Limbo, Braid, and Super Meat Boy are all successful indie titles. All of these games have something in common, variety, innovation, and creativity compared to most AAA games. Unfortunately, because most indie games don't have the resources to market their games, the vast majority of them go completely unnoticed. Much like Scott Cawthon's games before FNAF, he spent 20 years developing games before finding success. However, when Five Nights at Freddy's was released in 2014, it had a huge impact on the indie game market. It showed that indie developers always have a chance, no matter what. FNAF brought unique gameplay mechanics and compelling mysterious serious lore. It also changed the horror genre, using constant suspense and jump scares while providing strategic mechanics. FNAF inspired horror game developers to explore similar mechanisms. It was a game that changed the face of the horror game industry. FNAF not only revolutionized the horror genre, but also had a significant impact on the fan game community. In 2014, many fans created their own games based on FNAF's mechanics, characters, and themes, resulting in a surge of fan-made content, including games, artwork, fan fiction, and mods. However, as many of the fan games were created by fans who were new to game development, the vast majority of them were just a reskin of FNAF. But there were a few gems that stood out from the crowd like Five Nights at Candy's, JR's, Tyke & Sons Lumber Co., Five Nights 
Nights at Chuck E. Cheese is rebooted, Five Nights at Treasure Island, The Return to Bloody Nights, The Joy of Creation, Pop Goes, and Jolly. There is a wide variety of fan games available, ranging from direct clones to unique adaptations. Some fan games stuck closely to the original FNAF formula, while others experimented with new gameplay mechanics, stories, and characters within the FNAF universe. Scott Cawthon did what many developers wouldn't. He supported the fan game community, he engaged with fans, offered advice to aspiring developers, and sometimes endorsed or recognized notable fan creations, encouraging the community's enthusiasm and creativity. In contrast, most AAA developers would immediately resort to lawsuits due to legal issues surrounding intellectual property and copyright. Nintendo Nintendo, for example, is notorious for this, like when they DMCA'd Game Jolt and removed over 500 fan games from their public sites. Any fan game that used characters, names, and locations from the Mario, Zelda, and Pokemon franchises was taken down immediately. One fan game that took 9 years to create, and the support of many people in the community was hit with multiple takedown notices, Scott chose not to, even though he had the legal authority to do so. Deep down, he knew that the more you support your fanbase, the more they will support you. So he started a new project called the Fazbear Fan Version initiative, in which he would work with several FNAF fan game creators. The initiative involves the endorsement and support of selected fan games within the FNAF community. Endorsed fan games will receive financial support, promotional assistance, help with console and mobile releases, and even help with merchandise sales. Some of the fan games involved are Five Nights at Candy's 4, Pop Goes Evergreen, and The Joy of Creation Ignited Collection, all of which are currently in development. This initiative is an excellent example of how the gaming industry can transform into something more positive allowing talented, aspiring game developers to use intellectual property to create unique content that makes fans appreciate the original even more. Hopefully AAA developers can take note of this and bring something similar. As mentioned in Chapter 3, most indie games lack the resources to market their games, resulting in a large majority of them going unnoticed. YouTube played a crucial role in marketing FNAF as many prominent YouTubers began uploading gameplay videos of the game. YouTubers such as Markiplier, Corey Kenshin, PewDiePie, Jacksepticeye, and MatPat helped to market FNAF tremendously. These videos contributed to the game's popularity by entertaining viewers and creating curiosity about the game, often showing reactions to the game's tense and suspenseful moments. The dark atmosphere of the game and its mechanics which were unknown at the time created tense moments that proved highly entertaining for the viewers. This led to a snowball effect as viewers shared these videos, contributing to the game's virality and exposing it to a wider audience. Even after the initial popularity of FNAF, the YouTubers continued to create content around the game, contributing to the continued visibility and ongoing success of the game. They often played newly released sequels, mods, or fan-made games, keeping interest alive within their audiences. Another significant factor in the growth of FNAF was its lore. I won't cover the actual lore of the games in this video, but if you want to learn more, I recommend you check out this video by Gibi's Good Idea Bad Idea. It's pretty short and gets straight to the point. The link is in the description. Of course, lore isn't anything new in video games, but Scott Cawthon's implementation of complex, convoluted lore into his games was genius. Without it, interest in FNAF would have quickly died once the jump scares wore off. Thanks to the lore, FNAF continues to gain traction to this day with no signs of stock. There are hundreds of videos solely dedicated to exploring the lore of FNAF, with billions of views collectively. YouTube provides a platform for fans and content creators to discuss theories, strategies, and secrets related to FNAF, with millions of people coming together as a community to help solve the obscure yet fascinating story. Scott finally decided it was time, he just released Ultimate Custom Night, and finally finished what he had started. The story of FNAF was complete, but Scott realized he was missing a whole market, and that market was consoles. He didn't have the resources to release FNAF on consoles himself, so he decided to work with Click Team and make HD ports of the games to tap into the console gaming market. He also wanted to make a VR and AR game, but faced the same dilemma. So he partnered with two different studios, Steel Wool Studios for the virtual reality game and Illumix for the augmented reality game. Around this time, he announced his plans to create a big-budget, triple-A game and was working closely with the studio involved to ensure that the game would meet the expectations of FNAF fans. The following year saw the release of the VR and AR games. 
The VR game Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted, developed by Steel Wool Studios, was the first to be released. It is the eighth main game in the series and is a collection of minigames set in the Five Nights universe. The game requires you to complete several different tasks while surviving against the animatronics. The game received tons of praise from the community, becoming the second game in the FNAF franchise to reach the overwhelmingly positive review status on Steam. It turns out the FNAF experience perfectly fits into VR, delivering scares effortlessly. And soon after, the AR game was released. Five Nights at Freddy's Special Delivery, developed by Illumix, was released for free on mobile devices. The game, similar to other augmented reality games such as Pokemon Go, has the animatronics sent to you, and you have to survive using tools such as a flashlight and a controlled shocker. The story of the game takes place immediately after Help Wanted and begins to develop a brand new storyline in the FNAF series, hinting that there is more to come. The game was well received, with over 40 million downloads and over 100 million views on YouTube in its first year of release. It was praised as the most innovative game of the year, and everyone was still hungry for more. Scott decided it was time to give Steel Wool Studios another project, a bigger, better game set in the FNAF universe with free roam, cutscenes, objectives, collectibles, and more. And on August 8, 2019, the fifth anniversary of the franchise, the new game was teased on Scott's website, showing four animatronic characters performing on stage. And soon after, they began to work on the game. Unfortunately, despite Scott's attempts to keep the game under wraps, the game suffered several leaks. One of the most significant leaks came from Funko, a company known for creating pop culture collectibles. Details of the game, including new characters and elements, were inadvertently revealed through these leaks. Then shortly after, the name of the game, Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, was leaked due to a trademark government page. After that, the character designs were leaked on Amazon, with several more leaks to follow. Scott, who had spent years doing everything himself to make sure it was done right, was furious. He had never had to deal with major leaks before, let alone several in a row. But he was happy with the game itself, and the game's release date at the end of 2020 was approaching. However, due to the unexpected size of the game and the addition of new content with the game being super ambitious and of course the pandemic, the release was pushed back to early 2021. Then early 2021 arrived and there was no game. Steel Wool and Scott wanted to continue to make the game as big as possible and put more money and time into it. So he released another Reddit post letting the community know that there would be another delay as well as a new free FNAF spin-off game called Security Breach Fury's Rage, a beat-em-up game in the style of Streets of Rage as an apology to the fan base. Few months later, on December 16th, 2021, Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach was released. In the game, you play as a new character in the series named Gregory, who is trapped in a new location in the series, Fazbear's Mega Pizza Complex. The game was very different from the original FNAF games. Instead of a static office with point-and-click mechanics, Security Breach introduced free-roaming gameplay, allowing players to explore and make the game more immersive. Security Breach also featured only one night instead of the game's iconic five. And as I mentioned earlier, this game introduced a variety of objectives to complete and a more direct narrative instead of the obscure ones of the original game. While the game sounds amazing on paper, it received a lot of mixed reviews from the community. However, most of the bad reviews about the game were due to the numerous bugs and glitches that were present at the game release. These technical issues range from teleporting enemies, players phasing through walls, and even instances of character duplication. Some of these glitches made the game completely unplayable. Some reviewers also reported that the game felt rushed and lacked the scare factor of the original game. Despite these issues, there were still many players who appreciated the game's narrative, voice acting, new open-world gameplay style, and many references to older games in the series. However, in response to the critical backlash, Steel Wool released a major update that fixed over 100 bugs bugs and glitches. Despite all the problems, the game was still a financial success. But Scott found himself at a crossroads with the community as the game was successful but left many of the hardcore FNAF fans very upset, some going as far as to say that it ruined the series. To make matters worse, a few months earlier, due to controversy from some people in the community over his political donations, Scott retired from creating games, but will continue as creative director of his many ongoing projects until he finds a successor. One of these projects was FNAF Ruin, a free DLC expansion pack released two years later for Security Breach. Set after the events of Security Breach, Ruin sees you playing as Gregory's friend Cassie, returning to a ruined version of Pizzaplex to find and rescue Gregory. Ruin is generally regarded as a significant improvement over Security Breach. The DLC has been described as redeeming the base game, which was criticized for its flaws and lack of scares. Ruin brought back the dark and gritty atmosphere of the first FNAF and it is considered a strong entry in the FNAF series, with many fans 
audience looking forward to what the franchise will offer next. Luckily for the fans, they didn't have to wait long. Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted 2 was released four months after Ruin and provided a follow-up to the first Help Wanted. Once again, you are placed in the shoes of a Fazbear Entertainment employee and you must complete various tasks throughout the location since the game's narrative and endings contribute to the ongoing lore and storytelling within the FNAF series, it is considered an important game to play for FNAF fans. The reception of Help Wanted 2 is similar to the first with high reviews all around with some fans calling it the best FNAF game of all time, showing that Steel Wool learned from their previous mistakes and listened to feedback to create a better game. As of today, this was the last FNAF release, but FNAF is far from over, there will be more to come. Back in April 2015, The Hollywood Reporter announced that Warner Brothers had acquired the rights to create a film adaptation of FNAF, with Scott Cawthon involved in the production. This was extremely impressive for an indie developer who had only created the first game a year prior. However, the project faced challenges, including changes in directors and script rewrites. Two years later, there was complete silence surrounding the project. The film was doomed from the start, including Scott's concerns about the direction of the project due to his lack of direct involvement and Warner Brothers' inability to get the animatronics to work on set. These issues ultimately led to the film's cancellation. In March 2017, Warner Brothers dropped the rights to the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, and Scott then transferred transferred the rights to Blumhouse Productions, with the condition that he would have creative input. Jason Blum, the founder of Blumhouse, agreed to this condition and they collaborated to create the film. Unfortunately for Scott, he discovered that the movie industry's procedures are exceedingly slow. In a Reddit comment thread, he replied to a question about the movie news by stating, There is a lot that I still don't understand about the movie business, but one thing I've learned is that every step in the process takes literally forever. I understand now why so many movies get stuck in development. And Scott's observation was accurate. The film took an additional six years to finally get released. On October 27, 2023, The Five Nights at Freddy's movie was released in theaters and on the streaming platform Peacock. The film featured characters from the game and expanded on the lore while existing in its own universe. The reception to the movie was mixed, with many critics disappointed, but many audiences and fans of the game praised it for living up to expectations. The movie has been a commercial success, grossing over $290 million worldwide and becoming one of the highest grossing movies of 2023. Following the success of the first film, Blumhouse immediately began development on the second, continuing the long list of Scott Cawthon's successes. Five Nights at Freddy's is a truly inspirational game. I mean, this game came out of nowhere and created a new genre of games overnight. This new subgenre is known as mascot horror, characterized by the use of friendly looking, often child friendly mascots or characters in disturbing or eerie family friendly environments, creating a stark contrast that amplifies the horror element. These mascots, while sometimes disturbing in appearance, tend to retain some semblance of the idea that they were once intended for children. Popularized by FNAF, this subgenre has grown rapidly in a short period of time, with many games emulating the style. Games like Bendy and the Ink Machine, Poppy Playtime, Garten of Banban, -Ban, Hello Neighbor, Duck Season, Amanda the Adventure, and Mr. Hop's Playhouse are all examples of this genre. Most of these games exemplify the things that made FNAF popular, such as doubling down on hidden obscure lore and using YouTube Let's Plays and theory videos as a form of free marketing. With some games getting exceptionally dirty with these tactics in order to market their mascot-oriented merchandise and make as much money as possible off the trend, but that is the subject of another video, so let me know in the comments if if you want me to make a video about it. Five Nights at Freddy's is currently one of the most popular indie games in the world, with billions of views across YouTube and a wildly successful franchise making millions of dollars. Built off of a community of people who have been able to come together to do some pretty incredible things, they've worked together to solve a super obscure story from the books to the games, created thousands of fan games that have entertained many, and FNAF has inspired millions and changed many lives. Whether you are an aspiring game designer or someone working in a difficult field, Scott's story has the ability to inspire and show that you can create something that can change your life and the lives of others, whether you are a fan of the FNAF games or not. One thing is clear, Five Nights at Freddy's has changed the world.
Now, there's no denying that Five Nights at Freddy's helped change the internet as we know it, but right now there are small teams of independent animators who are changing the animation world for the better. If you're interested in how indie animators are challenging big corporations like Disney, you can watch right now by clicking on this thumbnail on the screen. Thanks for watching and a special thank you to the over 1500 people who have subscribed to my channel so far. I'll see you in the next video.